Hi, good evening. I want to welcome you to this evening's Alexander Clark Lecture. My name is Naomi DeWinter, and I serve as the president of Muscatine Community College. It's nice to see so many familiar faces on the campus again. Uh, you will uh, know that we have had a series of um, uh, events honoring Alexander Clark's history in Muscatine including a dedication yesterday at the hotel. And I know there's an upcoming event in which Kent Sissel will be starring. Uh, Kent, would you like to talk about that before we introduce tonight's speaker? I don't think I'm starring, but I... Uh, on Thursday, I'm going to be speaking at uh, Muscatine Art Center uh, at 5.30 about the uh, early genealogy of Alexander Clark uh, and, and his early life. So as I was saying yesterday, you know, I have some theories of what, uh, how Alexander Clark got his name, what the G stands for, and what the G stands for in his son's, his deceased son's name means, um, because there was a John G. Clark who died at a very young age, and an Ellen G. Clark who also died at a very young age, probably because of one of the epidemics that came through town, uh, and I think I know what that heard. G stands for as well. So we're going to talk about that tomorrow, um, Thursday, 5.30, Muscatine Arts Center. Thank you. All so, yours. Yep. Before I introduce our speaker for tonight, let me ask Mayor Broderson to come up for the proclamation. Naomi, and thanks to all of you for coming again today. And several of you were there yesterday while we were dedicating the room at the Merrill Hotel to be the Alexander Clark Room. I wanted to just share with you the uh, proclamation that we did this year, but also in perpetuity. So every February 25th in Muscatine will now be Alexander Clark Day, today. Whereas Alexander G. Clark, 1826 to 1891, became a leader for racial justice and human equality while a young man in Muscatine and persisted in that cause until his death while serving in Liberia as United States Ambassador. And whereas Clark's achievements are rightly praised upon the 150th anniversary of the 1868 landmark ruling by the Iowa Supreme Court, which became a national precedent for securing the rights of all children equally to public school education. And whereas Clark performed a singular and central role in winning the vote by Iowans that same year, which removed racial preference from our state constitution. And whereas the people of Muscatine take pride in preserving the Clark legacy as a celebration of Iowa's equal rights pioneers. And whereas the city of Muscatine has affirmed that our renowned resident should be honored and remembered by his hometown perpetually. And whereas Clark's birthday, February 25th of 1826, was established as Alexander Clark Day in perpetuity by a unanimous vote of the Muscatine City Council on January 18th of 2018. Now therefore I, Diana Broderson, Mayor of the City of Muscatine, do hereby proclaim Monday February 25th, 2019, today, to be observed as Alexander Clark Day. Thank you. So our guest speaker tonight is Dwayne Coleman, who is a PhD student at the University of Iowa, and we're delighted to have him with us this evening. You were also here yesterday for the, the hotel room dedication. His master's thesis, Still in the Fight, The Struggle for Community for Black Civil War Veterans, won the Iowa History Center Award for Outstanding Thesis in Iowa History. Duane also received the Robert D. Duckendorf Fellowship to research the history of Burlington's African American community. Duane's research looks at how black Civil War veterans utilized the political capital of their military service to secure civil rights and community space for themselves and their families in local communities throughout the Midwest. Duane is also a founding member and co-organizer of the Iowa Colored Conventions Project. Please help me welcome Duane Coleman. Thank you. 
to be with you this evening. Thank you all for coming. Um, uh, I'm not originally from Las, or not originally from Iowa. I'm actually from Las Vegas, it's a much warmer uh, place <laughs> than it is right now here in Iowa. Um, but uh, in coming to Iowa uh, and getting to know this wonderful story about Alexander Clark and the African American. Um, uh, African Americans who made Iowa their home, uh, you know, I, I, I feel a, a kinship to um, uh, Alexander Clark uh, and the history uh, of African Americans here in Iowa. Um, so it's a great privilege to be able to, to talk with you today about Alexander Clark and the legacy of black activism uh, in Iowa, which is a, a rich uh, legacy. Um, so, so first off, uh, Alexander Clark uh, made uh, a lifelong friend with uh, another national figure, uh, Frederick Douglass. So Alexander Clark and Frederick Douglass had a lifelong friendship um, for over 40 years. They were friends. And um, they exchanged a number of uh, uh, letters uh, with one another over the years. A few of those we have. And I'd like to read uh, just, uh, t just one of those uh, here. Uh, this one uh, was written by uh, Frederick Douglass to Alexander Clark uh, shortly before Ale or Frederick Douglass accepted the uh, call to uh, become uh, the minister of Haiti. And Frederick Douglass says this, Dear Sir, I give you thanks for your warm, hearty, and earnest congratulations. The effort to discredit us by sending a gentleman of the white variety to Haiti has failed. And the effort to discredit me with the administration has likewise failed. The tax set before me in Haiti is no child's play and, with, and will tax my best endeavors. I am going to be, I'm going to, I'm going to a divided and just now turbulent country whose moral influence on the destiny of the colored race on this continent cannot be overstated. Our enemies are just now saying, look at Haiti. You may depend upon me to exert my influence. I may, uh, I may to promote the peace and welfare of that country, as well as to represent and care for our own country's welfare. Many of my friends think me unwise to go to Haiti at my time of life, but I think I shall go nevertheless. Uh, in, in haste, yours very truly, and to the end, Frederick Douglass. So, uh, as this uh, correspondence uh, shows, as the correspondence shows, the relationship between Alexander Clark uh, and Frederick Douglass was a close one. They were friends. They were friends for many decades. Um, and they were friends because they were engaged in the same cause. And that was the uplift of, of, the, of the black, uh, of black people uh, in the United States. Uh, and they took every opportunity that they could to, um, uh, to improve the situation of African Americans throughout the country. Alexander Clark was not just a state figure. He wasn't just a regional figure. Um, he was a national figure. And at the time of his death, too, he was becoming an international figure as well, too. So I'd like to talk today a little bit more about Alexander Clark uh, and hopefully share maybe some new things with you. Uh, that you may not know about Alexander Clark. So Alexander Clark, and I may walk around, so maybe I should take this off. All right. So Alexander Clark um, was born 193 years ago today. So he was born in 1920 or 1826. Sorry, born in 1826. Um, in Washington County, Pennsylvania, um, and uh, he was born to free parents. They were both free. Um, at at uh, eventually, uh, fast forwarding, uh, eventually he ends up in Cincinnati, um, and he learns the barber trade uh, from his uncle. Uh, while in Cincinnati, uh, Cincinnati is a very interesting place during uh, during this time period. Um, and uh, there are a number of riots that break out in Cincinnati, uh, race revolts that happen. Uh, 
because of the increasing black population in Cincinnati. Um, and so in, uh, th this happens over a number of years. In 1829 uh, is, is one of the largest, uh, 1836, 1841, 53, and 55. Uh, and Alexander Clark was, was present for one of these in 1841. Um, so as a young man, he witnessed this, uh, this riot that took place. Uh, the first riot uh, that happened in 1829 um, happened as a result of, as I said, the increasing black population there and the attempt by um, uh, many white people uh, in uh, Cincinnati to try to enact uh, the exclusionary laws that Ohio had passed. So there were, uh, Ohio had passed a, a series of laws that tried to keep black people from, from migrating to the state. Uh, and so at, um, uh, at certain times when they felt threatened at the migration of black people into uh, the state and into the city, they tried to enact these laws. So in doing so, th this sparked uh, uh, a lot of anger and resentment, uh, both in the black community and in the uh, a working class white community as well, and resulted in um, this race revolt in 1829. Uh, it was so severe that um, over 2,000 African Americans decided to leave the city. So they left, um, some of them going to other parts of Ohio, some of them leaving the state, and some of them you know, leaving the country and going to Canada. Um, so th the tensions in Cincinnati, to say the least, were very high. Uh, and the tensions continued uh, over the years. Uh, in 1841, there was another one of these riots that took place, these revolts that took place. And Alexander Clark, as I said, uh, as a teen, was there. He was, he was in Cincinnati during this time period. And uh, what's very interesting is, is that uh, a month after this, uh, uh, after this revolt took place, um, he actually leaves. And I think that part of the reason why he, um, he left was because of the racial tension that was happening in Cincinnati. And maybe it was at the, you know, the encouragement of his uncle to go somewhere else where it would be safer, to find somewhere else where um, you know, African Americans had more freedoms. Uh, so that eventually led Alexander Clark to, uh, to Muscatine. Um, but when Alexander Clark uh, gets to oh, uh, Iowa, um, it, you know, Iowa has its own issues dealing with race uh, during this time period. Um, when uh, the territory of Iowa is formed in 1839, there are a number of black laws that are passed. Uh, and uh, some of those laws that were passed were restrictions on jury service. Uh, black people could not serve on a jury. They could not testify against a white person. Um, they, they weren't entitled to a public education as all white children were during this time period. Um, they could not vote and they were not allowed to serve in the state militia. Um, so Iowa from the very beginning uh, of its organization as a territory uh, attempted to try to limit the rights of, of blacks. At the same time, they also tried to keep um, uh, the migration of black people down in Iowa as well. And they passed what were known as uh, 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 exclusionary acts. So an act to regulate blacks and mulattoes was an act that was passed. Um, and uh, the purpose of it was to, as I said, keep uh, black people out of the state. So the, the act required that any black person who entered the state had to pay a $500 bond, which was a large sum of money during that time period. It would have been very difficult for anybody to pay uh, such a bond. Uh, and they also had to present their uh, free papers uh, to whatever county uh, they decided to settle in um, to ensure that they were indeed free, free pe people. Um, Sometimes the bond could be um, superseded by a um, signature by a white male um, saying that they took responsibility for this um, black individual. Um, 
So uh, the exclusionary laws that Iowa, pa Iowa passed and would continue to pass over the years or attempt to pass over the years was very similar to other exclusionary acts that were passed throughout, um, throughout the Midwest. As I mentioned before, Ohio had its own exclusionary acts that it passed and attempted to try to implement um, and which resulted in some of the racial tensions that were happening uh, in Cincinnati. Um, so when uh, Alexander Clark leaves um, Ohio and comes to Muscatine, Iowa, uh, he, he encounters um, uh, these uh, kind of restrictions when he arrives. Some other restrictions to, for African Americans were, was the anti-miscegenation law um, that uh, Iowa passed uh, a couple years after the territory was formed. Uh, and uh, the, the purpose of it was to ensure that uh, there were no unions between black and white people. Um, and anyone who was married, um, they, uh, any black or white person who were married to each other who came to the state, their marriages were null and void. <laughs> And there, there, we have at least one account in which this, uh, both of these, um, the Act to Regulate Blacks and Mulattoes uh, and the marriage, um, the anti-miscegenation law were uh, enacted in, in order to try to force out um, uh, at least one couple from the state. Uh, so the, you have the territory um, uh, laws, uh, the restrictions to black citizenship, um, but uh, instead of getting better, uh, some, uh, some of these things got worse. So in 1851, uh, the state legislature passed an, uh, an exclusionary act, which was even worse than uh, the act to regulate blacks and mulattoes. And it actually um, uh, was an act to keep out black people from the state. So it, it actually uh, didn't allow for any black migration to the state, so in 1851. And this is most likely due to the, um, the Fugitive Slave Act that was passed in 1851. Um, so fearing that there would be a mass black migration to the state, the state lawmakers passed this exclusionary act in order to ensure that uh, black people um, would not enter the state. That being said, even though there were all of these laws, you still had individuals like Alexander Clark, black individuals like Alexander Clark, who were continuing to migrate to, to Iowa and making Iowa their home. Um, so while some may have been discouraged from moving to Iowa, there were still many others who decided to risk it and come. So this was a, uh, this, the, the passage of this act uh, sparked a lot of fears uh, in the black community uh, throughout Iowa. And um, let me go back here. So as you can see here on the, uh, on the right side right here is a petition. And this petition uh, was signed by 33 um, black um, Iowans from Muscatine. And at the top of the list is a name that everybody will recognize, which is Alexander Clark. So one of the earliest, um, uh, documents that we have of Alexander Clark's activism comes as a result of uh, his and his community's attempt to try to uh, get rid of um, this exclusionary act of 1851. So this petition is actually signed in 1855, so a couple years after the exclusionary act um, goes into effect. So uh, Alexander Clark in coming to Iowa, um, he, he doesn't come to a state um, that is free from prejudice and free from discrimination. Uh, he comes to a state that is, uh, has, has its own issues um, and has its own problems. And, and there are threats to the black community. And uh, I'm sure that his experience in Cincinnati played a role in his desire to become active and worked for, work for equality for African Americans in Iowa. So one of the things that uh, Alexander Clark became quite involved in were um, called colored conventions. So colored convention, the, the colored convention movement was a movement um, that started as a result of the 1829 Cincinnati uh, race revolt. 
So uh, African Americans, after you know experiencing you know this uh, horrific event in Cincinnati, they decided to hold a conference to discuss what they should do. Should we remain in Ohio? Should we remain in the country, um, or should we leave? It was really the, one of the biggest topics during this convention. Uh, and so this convention uh, became known as a colored convention, and it set off a movement uh, in which African Americans from all over the country would gather together for a national convention uh, or regional convention and state conventions to discuss the issues that African Americans faced. Uh, and to try to create um, um, a collective body that then could combat the, uh, the trial, the, the uh, the trials that African Americans were facing during that time period. Um, and so things like education, uh, citizenship rights, voting rights, um, uh, the ability to serve in militias, these all became important issues that the colored conventions discussed and talked about, the individuals who attended. Alexander Clark uh, becomes an active participant in these colored conventions. So Iowa holds a number of colored conventions. The first one that we have record of uh, happens in 1857 in Muscatine, Iowa. And Alexander Clark is very influential in uh, establishing uh, and organizing this colored convention. And, um, and so it happens, of course, in Muscatine, uh, where there is a, a sizable African-American community during this time period. Uh, and so they discuss the issues that are going on in Iowa during this time period. There is a constitutional convention that's happening uh, in Iowa. And they uh, decide, in holding this convention, that they want to change some things in the Constitution. They want to get rid of uh, some of the statutes that are in the Constitution. They want to get rid of um, the word, strike the word white from, uh, from all instances in the Constitution, which then would provide African Americans with those rights that they were denied as a result of uh, the Constitution during that time period. Um, and so, uh, so th that was the purpose of the Color Convention that they held in 1857. Uh, it was really an attempt to try to, um, to improve the rights of African Americans, not just in Muscatine, but throughout the state during this time period. And they held a number of other conventions. I'm part of a uh, organization uh, found uh, or a project uh, that is attempting to uh, uh, a digital project that is attempting to find, uh, study, and uh, provide resources uh, to the public about these colored conventions. Um, so uh, we, we've been at, we've discovered at least ten colored conventions. Two of those colored conventions um, we we discovered just this past week. So. Uh, so there's still work to be done. There's still uh, a lot that we don't know. Uh, and it just takes time, it takes energy to be able to, uh, to, to search these things. Um, but what we learn is, uh, what we see from these colored conventions is really a, a wealth of knowledge about the, the concerns and the efforts um, that the uh, African American community here in Iowa uh, um, had and, and, and the efforts that they put into trying to solve uh, the problems that they, they faced in the state of Iowa. Uh, Alexander Clark was, uh, was also influence, influential in um, esta establishing a regiment, uh, a colored regiment, during the Civil War. So uh, initially when the Civil War breaks out, African Americans are not allowed to serve. Uh, Alexander Clark petitions the, the governor uh, during that time period to allow him to uh, form a regiment, and he's denied it. Uh, the, the governor is sympathetic, but uh, he knows that public opinion is against um, establishing a regiment. Uh, it's not until after the passage of the Emancipation Proclamation uh, that African American, uh, African Americans, uh, eventually the, the, the governor and the legislature of Iowa um, allow uh, African -American, uh, an African-American regiment to be formed. So uh, in 1863, the first Iowa Volunteer Infantry of African descent, also known as, later known as the, the 60th United States Colored Infantry, uh, is formed. And Alexander Clark plays an, uh, takes an active role in enlisting uh, African-Americans around the region uh, into uh, this regiment. Uh, 
Um, so he is very active uh, in, in going as far as St. Paul, Minnesota to um, uh, sign up uh, uh, prospective soldiers. Uh, he, he is so eager to uh, enlist soldiers that he even goes so far as to give them his, his pay. So for each, uh, uh, his recruitment pay. So for each soldier that he recruits, he receives $2. So it said that he, at one point in time, and I think it was on his trip to St. Paul, um, gave up uh, $2, uh, $2 um, but gave the $2 to each of the uh, soldiers that he recruited there, and which was about 50 soldiers. So this would have been a sizable chunk of money, right, uh, that he would have been given up, months and months of pay really, for, for the average worker during this time period. Um, that's, that's how much he was dedicated to this cause. Um, by this time, he was already a successful businessman. Um, he had held quite a bit of property uh, in Muscatine. Um, he was a successful barber. Um, so he, um, he had the ability to be able to care for himself uh, very comfortably by this time period. And he was willing to give back in order to establish this uh, regiment. And the reason being is because he realized that uh, the enlistment of black men into the U.S. Army um, would be a great uh, would be of great benefit in claiming citizenship rights for African Americans, because of course, uh, as you may know, with the Dred Scott decision, uh, African Americans were not citizens of the United States as a result of that Supreme Court decision, uh, and soldiering was. Uh, uh, was the epitome of citizenship. So if, if black, uh, black men could become soldiers, then it would be a great argument for uh, obtaining citizenship rights for African Americans. So in, in realizing this, uh, Alexander Clark was eagerly uh, enlisting African American soldiers into the cause. But one thing I want to say too, it just like the petition that Alexander Clark uh, signed along with 32 other uh, Muscatine uh, black residents, um, uh, is that uh, Alexander Clark didn't do these things alone. He wasn't by himself. This was a community effort. Often Alexander Clark was put forward as the mouthpiece of the community of Muscatine and also of African Americans in Iowa, but it was a community effort. Um, and one example of that is in the, uh, in the creation of the flag for that regiment, for the 60th United States Colored Infantry. Um, the, the flag was sewn by um, the women of Keokuk uh, in Muscatine. Um, so this was their way of showing their commitment to uh, the cause of freedom and also their, uh, their patriotism to the country. This was their way of showing that they as women uh, were, were also equal to men and equal to, uh, and should receive citizenship rights. Um, so uh, this was, uh, so the flag is, is a great symbol, uh, a beautiful flag. Uh, it's a little worn and tattered now over the years, but uh, um, that, that's an actual picture there. Uh, the two pictures that you see there are, are two soldiers uh, that served in the 60th who later uh, settled in uh, Newton, Iowa. And they have an amazing story uh, in and of themselves. They were both brothers. Um, so, dear, so with the service of uh, these, these black soldiers, um, uh, there were, this allowed them to be, allowed uh, African Americans in the state to be able to petition for more rights. As I said, uh, soldiering was, an, it was, uh, was the epitome of citizenship um, during this time period. And so um, uh, there were, as a result of their service, they were able to prove um, the, their worthiness to be citizens. Uh, and so there were some attempts to try to use the Exclusionary Act after the passage of the Emancipation Proclamation there were some individuals who were very upset and very angry and, and fearful, too, of black migration. And during the Civil War, there were a number of uh, black people known as contraband of war um, that, were, that, were actually, that actually came to Iowa. Uh, and some people didn't like this. And uh, one of those individuals who came to Iowa was someone who uh, served 
uh, as a laborer uh, in an Iowa regiment, a, a white Iowa regiment. His name was Archie Webb. And Archie Webb um, came to Iowa with the son of Dr. James Wright. And Dr. James Wright eventually became um, the Secretary of State of Iowa. So when he, uh, so his son, the, so the son brings him back to Iowa, and having served along with the the son's regiment, the all white regiment, um, you know they uh, offered him a job, and he, he began living in Iowa. There was an attempt, though, after the passage of the Emancipation Proclamation, to try to use the Exclusionary Act to kick, kick Archie Webb out of the county and out of the state. This is an actual uh, picture of the. Of the, of the actual document that told Archie Webb um, that he uh, was illegally living in Iowa and needed to leave. So, so as a result of this, because of the connections that Archie Webb had created as, as he, he served alongside um, an Iowa regiment, um, he was able to utilize that connection uh, in petitioning for um, uh, his right not to leave the state. This eventually went to the Iowa Supreme Court, and the Iowa Supreme Court struck down the 1851 Exclusionary Act. So this was the beginning of the end for Exclusionary Acts in Iowa. Uh, and uh, uh, James Wright eventually helped to pass a bill um, that eventually became law that uh, outlawed the Exclusionary Act as well. So, um, so again, the, the service of uh, black soldiers uh, was very important to uh, was very important to uh, further uh, making uh, the argument that African Americans deserve citizenship rights in the state of Iowa and, and in the country. Um, after the war, African American soldiers um, organized a, a color convention. As I said, color conventions become very important during this time period. Alexander Clark realizing the, um, you know, that, that this is a moment, that we need to utilize this momentum uh, uh, that he, after the 60th return home to Davenport and are discharged, they actually hold a convention. He organizes a convention there in Davenport and they, um, uh, and they, they sign a petition that goes to the state legislature demanding voting rights for African American men as a result of their service. So this is, uh, this is a claim that they continue to make until uh, eventually um, voting rights are passed, uh, uh, voting, uh, uh, voting rights are given to African Americans um, uh, later, a few years after that. So uh, another thing that becomes very important for Alexander Clark is education. Education. And many of you have, have heard of you know, this case with Susan Clark, his daughter, um, and the, uh, the Supreme Court case that results uh, in their attempt to try to integrate the school in Muscatine. Um, just recently, uh, my advisor uh, came across a newspaper clipping um, that uh, talks about um, the African American uh, Episcopal Church, um, or uh, African Methodist Episcopal Church, and how uh, in Muscatine, and how they actually petitioned the uh, the the, uh, the Muscatine School Board uh, to uh, integrate the uh, the white school in Muscatine. They had a, they, the AME church had a uh, black school uh, that they ran uh, in the church. Um, but they actually, they, they decided as a community that they were no longer going to continue to run that school and that they wanted to integrate the community, um, integrate the school there. And so Alexander Clark, again, um, takes the lead. Um, so it is a community effort is the point that I want to make here. It's a community effort that pushes forward um, this, uh, this case. Uh, and Susan Clark is chosen as the individual who is going to, to, um, um, uh, going to um, put forward this effort to integrate the schools. I think what's really interesting about that is they don't choose uh, a boy to do that, right? They choose a girl. They choose Susan Clark. Um, which shows that you know, the, the, you know, during this time period, you know, uh, women receiving education wasn't wasn't priority, uh, and uh, and here Alexander Clark and the rest of the community they support this. They put forward Susan Clark, uh, and eventually this, of course, goes to the Supreme Court, and they rule in their favor. 
Now, this doesn't mean that uh, automatically schools are all desegregated uh, in Iowa. There is still work to be done. In fact, um, the, the, the work to try to integrate schools has been going on for years before this court case uh, even comes about. Uh, in fact, I mentioned the two individuals from, from Newton. Um, there were two, two men, uh, two soldiers, veterans, who returned home from the war, and a month or two after they returned home from the war, they began to go to school in Newton with white students. Uh, and some of the, uh, the white parents of Newton um, become very upset with this, of the idea of their, their children going to school with, um, with black, black people. And, uh, but because of the, the, the service that the men have rendered to the state and to the country, and because of their good standing in the community, they eventually uh, earned the support of um, most of the, the community members, uh, and they helped to integrate the Newton School. This happens before the, uh, the Clark case. This happens before the Clark case. Uh, and eventually, Newton becomes a very important community for African Americans. There's a large, uh, a sizable African American community that forms there, and education becomes, uh, you know, a very, a very key component of their community. And the Iowa Bystander, um, uh, towards the end of the century, uh, there's an article that's um, uh, um, written that says that it's the fashion, the fashion for African American children to go to school in Newton. And it also said that um, per capita, uh, Newton graduated more black students than even Des Moines did. So education becomes very important, and it is a community effort, right? It, it is a community effort uh, to try to provide education um, for African American children. Um, so this is one instance, the Alexander Clark instance. Um, it, so the story of Susan Clark and the rest of the Clark family doesn't just end with um, the, uh, you know, the right to go to school. Um, the, here's an article here about, uh, that was actually uh, 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 in the Chicago Tribune, August 1st, 1871, announcing uh, Susan Clark's graduation. And it said that she graduated at the top of her class, right? She was, um, so uh, the, the one thing I want to say too is that, that the Clark family was actively involved in all of these things. If we were to go back to the, pin, or go back to the petition, we can see that there are a number of Clark family members, including Catherine Clark, uh, Alexander Clark's wife, and Rebecca Clark, uh, his daughter, which, interesting enough, she was only a year old when, when, the, when her name was put on the petition, right? So, so this is, again, a community effort, a family effort, and the Clark family was very close. Uh, many of the, even their grown children lived with them uh, for many years after, uh, after they were even married. So education, as I said, is very important. Uh, Alexander Clark and Rebecca, uh, uh, or, or, or Alexander Clark will graduate as well from Muscatine. Uh, he will later go on uh, to uh, graduate from the Iowa Law College. And he will be the first African American to do so. That only comes as a result of, um, again, uh, there were a number of black laws that were still on the, uh, still in the Constitution. And it was only after uh, the law that prohibited uh, uh, black lawyers uh, from being uh, from from um, uh, from from the creation of, uh, of black lawyers uh, in Iowa that it, it allowed him to be able to go to school uh, and, and graduate from the Iowa Law College. Um, so Alexander Clark Jr. became the first, and uh, and, and a few years later in 1884. Uh, Alexander Clark Sr. became the second African-American to graduate from the law school. Now what I think is really interesting about this too is that in 1879, September 1879, when Alexander Clark Jr. graduates, that same month his mother dies. So, um, so, uh, so uh, Catherine Clark uh, dies the same month that he graduates from the law school. I'm sure that that was a, a huge blow to, Alexander, to the Clark family uh, in general, but also to Alexander Clark Sr. Uh, Alexander Clark Sr. will I enroll uh, in college after, you know, after the graduation of his son. Uh, and he will um, get his law degree in 1884. Even after the loss of his wife, 
Uh, even being eight, 58 years old, he decides to go back to school and get a law degree. I find that very fascinating. Why, why would an individual do this? I think it was because he saw, um, he, he saw himself as uh, a figure for the community in Iowa, and a national figure as well. And he saw this as a way of progressing the cause of African Americans. Uh, he was what was called a race man, meaning that he promoted the cause of African Americans where, in, in any way that he could. So I think that his becoming a lawyer, maybe it was a lifelong dream that he had, but at the same time, this was, this was also, uh, uh, again, something that would strengthen the African American community in Iowa. I, I believe that he, he knew that, and, uh, and that's one of the reasons why he decided to do it, even though he was, very, he was a, a very prosperous businessman during this time period, um, was very well known, um, he, he still, you know, was still progressing, he was still trying to better himself and his community. Um, so here's Alexander Clark. You can see, I don't know if I did a, yeah, there we go. There's Alexander Clark right there in the middle and his graduating class. So Alexander Clark was also uh, very um, uh, actively involved in promoting the black press. And so he, um, uh, during the time period in which he was going to school to get his law degree, he actually decided to purchase a, uh, a newspaper in Chicago, so known as the Chicago Conservator. Uh, and so he became the owner. Uh, the Chicago Conservator was actually uh, founded and owned by Ferdinand uh, Barnett. And uh, Ferdinand Barnett, um, sold the conservator to him. I think he still held part, uh, part, of, uh, owner, part ownership in it, but Alexander Clark became the editor. So while he was uh, you know, going to law school, he was the owner and editor of a newspaper in Chicago. So he's going to law school in Iowa, uh, but he owns a newspaper in Chicago. So he, he, Alexander Clark Jr. also worked uh, with uh, Alexander Clark Sr. With this, uh, on this newspaper. So they, they both purchased this uh, newspaper and then lead it through a very trying time for the newspaper. Many uh, uh, black newspapers especially, but newspapers in general, failed um, uh, quite often. And so he, was, he purchased it and led the newspaper through a very challenging time, um, and the newspaper lasted for, for many decades after. Um, in fact, uh, Burnett will eventually uh, repurchase the newspaper, and uh, you know the significance of uh, Barnett and the newspaper is, is that uh, Barnett will marry Ida B. Wells, and Ida B. Wells will eventually purchase that very newspaper that Alexander Clark helped to um, um, popularize and move through a very difficult time. So, uh, you know, of course, we know that Ida B. Wells is a very important figure uh, in the cause of um, uh, anti lynching, uh, uh, trying to get the, the passage of an anti lynching law. Uh, and supporting the, the rights of African Americans throughout the country. So again, Alexander Clark is, is, is not just an Iowa figure, he's a national figure. And uh, the, the, uh, uh, the Chicago conservator, um, you know, the articles from the conservator went all over the country. Uh, he also was a, a, an important figure in the National Colored Press Association. Uh, so he was even on uh, in 1887 during the National Color Association uh, Press uh, Association Conference. Uh, he was the chairman of the executive committee that put on the conference. Um, so, uh, so he was very influential uh, in the creation of a, and um, a promotion of the black press throughout the country. He also was very influential in the um, the creation of Prince Hall Masonry uh, lodges uh, throughout uh, the West. Um, he uh, helped to establish um, lodges as far as Colorado uh, and was the Grand Master um, uh, of the Grand Lodge of Missouri. Um, so uh, this was, uh, you know, the, the, the Masons was a fraternal order, very important to uh, networking uh, and uh, community activism. Uh, and so uh, he uh, made a lot of contacts through his uh, relationship with the Masons. Uh, 
uh, and um, uh, it was an important organization um, for African Americans. So he also, in 1881, sorry, in 1881, uh, goes to a conference um, for uh, a Methodist conference, the, the largest of its kind during that time period, held in London. Uh, so again, here we see he's not just a state figure, not just a regional figure, he's not just a national figure, but he also is a, an, he's becoming an international figure. He goes to, to London, um, and there's a lot of praise for the speeches that he gives in London, or at least one of the speeches that he gives in London. Um, he has a very successful political career, even during a time period in which African Americans aren't very well respected uh, and uh, aren't given um, uh, political positions in, uh, in political parties, either in the Republican Party or the Democratic Party during this time period. But he is able to secure a number of uh, positions um, in the Iowa Republican Party. Uh, he attends a number of uh, state Republican conventions in which he is a delegate. Um, and he also goes to a, a couple of the uh, national conventions as well as a delegate from Iowa. Um, he, he, uh, he, uh, he campaigns for a number of Republican uh, uh, politicians, including Grant. So Grant will come to Iowa uh, and he goes around and he gives, he, he gives a, you know, speeches trying to promote the election of Grant. Um, this will, of course, result in uh, his um, appo uh, the appointment to become the consul to Haiti uh, in 1873. Um, but, so Grant, Grant gives him this appointment. Um, and most likely it was because of the relationship that he had developed with Grant. Um, he had uh, gone to a number of these Republican conventions. Uh, he had met Grant uh, a couple of times as well. He had spoken on his behalf in, in Iowa. Um, and uh, I'm sure that, that was the, he was becoming very well known. Grant knew who he was. Um, and, uh, and so he received this appointment, but he turned it down. And the reason why he says he turned it down was because of the low pay. Um, and, uh, and so he turned it down but he'll get another shot. <laughs> so uh, in 1890, uh, he is appointed to become the ambassador to Liberia. Um, and I think that, you know, in the article that I initially read here, uh, uh, Frederick Douglass is talking about his appointment to Haiti. Uh, uh, Clark will eventually receive an appointment a few years after, the, after Douglass's appointment. I, I think that, um, you know, in the, the letter that Clark sends back to Douglas, he's worried about Douglas accepting this appointment to Haiti. He's worried about, you know, um, him and his advanced years going to um, this, this country that uh, has a lot of problems. Uh, and um, uh, he, he shows concern for, for uh, uh, Douglas um, as a result. But I, I think that Douglas, in his willingness to sacrifice himself, uh, for the good of African Americans, for the good of the country, I think that influenced him. I think that that um, uh, led him to want to do the same. And so uh, taking the position of Liberia, two other uh, ministers to Liberia had died prior to his becoming um, uh, the ambassador to Liberia. And so he knew the risks uh, in, in taking it, but he still took the position anyway. Um, he uh, The pay was quite good. Uh, he was paid $4,000 uh, uh, a year, which was, uh, I think, $1,000 more than the governor of Iowa. So uh, very good position, very good pay. But in going to Liberia, um, unfortunately, uh, he dies um, a few months after uh, his arrival there uh, in May 31st, 1831, on May 31st, 1830, or 1891, sorry. Um, so that doesn't end Alexander Clark's uh, memory uh, or, or legacy. Alexander Clark's legacy lives on. Um, there is even a push to try to, uh, uh, shortly after uh, Frederick Douglass's death. So after Alexander Clark dies in 91, Frederick Douglass, I believe, dies in uh, 95. And there is a push by, uh, in Iowa um, by a number of uh, uh, businessmen 
to, uh, and this is the uh, appeal uh, that they create, uh, the commission is created to, to try to raise $500 so that uh, portraits of both Frederick Douglass and Alexander Clark um, can be painted and then given, uh, and then um, put into the state capitol, right? Uh, in honor of these two men, these two men who had dedicated their lives um, to the service of the country. And uh, I, I think what's so poetic about that, of course, is, is here, you know, as I started off with this letter, these two individuals were friends throughout their lives. Uh, they worked very closely together. Um, the sad thing about it, though, is that while Frederick Douglass is very well known, Alexander Clark isn't as well known, right? So even though uh, Alexander Clark, um, you know, was engaged in the same cause, um, sacrifice from racial profiling. So there's a program that this just happened a couple weeks ago um, that the uh, University Heights in Iowa City, or in, in, in well, University Heights, uh, is, uh, has created this program to try to, to prevent and end racial profiling uh, in the community. Um, so there's things that can be done. Uh, there's things that we can improve. Um, and I think Alexander Clark uh, helps to show us the work that can be done um, by those who are committed to the cause of equal rights um, for all Iowans and for all people throughout the country, right? Um, so Alexander Clark is a great example of that. Um, but again, Alexander Clark didn't do it by himself. He did it with his community. He did it um, with the help of his family members. Um, and uh, we need to work together as well uh, to continue that legacy um, that he helped uh, to form. Thank you. Thank you.